A typical organizational chart that we had, no different than any organization, but the informal organizational chart was brick walls between bureaus, between commands. So if this person had an idea, it had to go all the way up the chain of command and all the way to the top and then had to come down to impact this person and then all the way up again and all the way down. The problem is that by the time you got an answer, it may be six months, it may be a year, if you ever get an answer to whatever new concept or new idea or new approach that you have. So people lost interest. And what was even worse is there were brick walls between levels of supervision. That's the reality. So it was my job and the job of my team to t tear down these brick walls and be more successful as an organization. So traditional organization, traditional policing, and, and as opposed to uh, uh, problem-oriented policing, and Johan talked about being incident-driven, strictly reactive. You focus on numbers. Numbers is an indicator of success. Numbers as in how many arrests did you write, how many uh, tickets did you write. That's the kind of easy things to track in, my, in, my, in the United States. Um, but here's the problem that the chief and the command and control make all the decisions and they push the decisions down. And the lower level of the organization has very little say on what's going to happen. Well, I'm a police chief, yes, but I'm not out there at 3 in the morning with my patrol officers. They have to make the decisions. They have to know what the parameters are and they have to be able to tell me this is the problem, this is the resources that I need in order to solve the problem. So we have to be able to not just empower but engage our employees to be part of the solution. Problem oriented policing is quite simple. It's uh, police officers are given a wider berth and pretty much given um, um, the ability to make decisions to address problems in their area of, of wherever they're assigned. Whether it's a beat, whether it's a, uh, uh, if they're detectives, caseload, whatever it is. Whatever their area of work that's where their assignment is and that's where they're empowered to do. We have something called the crime triangle and in every, every pretty much I'm, I'm guessing the same applies here in Sweden. Every time you have a crime you have to have three things. You have to have a victim. Without a victim you don't have a crime. You have to have a location and you have to have an offender, a suspect, a bad guy. So most organizations, traditional organizations focus on the offender. We have car burglaries in our city, quite a few. And we have people coming in from outside our community to burglarize cars and break into cars and steal people's stuff from their cars. Well, the city that I live in, that, I, that I'm the chief in now, is a rather affluent community. And so people leave a lot of stuff in their cars, their iPads, their computers, guns, a lot of things in their cars. And a lot of times they don't lock their cars. Sometimes they leave the windows open. So just here, take my stuff. And, and they, they take it. Well, if I have a crime spree going on and I have a pack of, of thieves that are going to city to city and addressing and, and burglarizing cars, if I arrest one of them, have I solved anything? The problem is that there's a thousand others behind them doing the same thing. So why don't we talk about the victim. Why don't we talk about the location? The idea is you remove one of these elements from the crime triangle, the triangle collapses, the problem is solved or moves on to another place. It's less of an impact. Why not work on prevention? Why not try to educate the victims and the citizens of my community to say lock your cars? Better yet, almost all houses in our city have garages. Park the car in the garage and close the garage door. We have a lot of new construction of homes in my community. So what they do is they build all those homes, they're getting ready to, to sell the house, somebody's going to buy it, so they, they put everything in that house. Uh, once it's almost ready, their refrigerators, their microwave ovens, their, their regular ovens, and then they leave. And the house isn't going to be uh, closed on or people aren't going to move in for another two weeks. Well, once they install all those appliances, guess what happens overnight? Bad guy comes in, takes the, the, the refrigerator, they take the microwave oven, they take everything. The home builder comes back and they call the police and we take a report. Then what? Then it goes to detectives and then there's no follow-up, so you inactivate the case and you go on to the next one. Happens time and time and time again. Well, my officer said, we're tired of doing that. That makes no sense. We're just taking reports on what's happening with it. 
So what they started to do is they called meetings of all the area home builders and they explained the problem. They showed them the data of these are one house, this is all the neighborhoods that are being hit. We need to do something different. So they're addressing the location and they're addressing the victim. So what they started to do is they encouraged the home builders to the microwave ovens have doors that can be removed. They don't install the doors till the people are ready to move into the house. Same thing applies to the refrigerator and to the oven. Well guess what, the, uh, the bad guys come in, they see that the, the appliance is not complete, they don't steal it. They go to another community or another city. The problem starts going down, the, the crime, the triangle collapses. When we work traffic accidents, we look at the location because sometimes enforcement isn't the answer. Sometimes it's re-engineering of that street, the lights, um, how the turning signals, whatever it takes to reduce accidents. So we apply the crime triangle in most all things. These are the officers on their own, the line officers. I don't, we introduced the concept and then I said you have free reign to determine how you're going to address the problem because I don't have time to do it. I have other responsibilities. And some of my police commanders don't have time to do it. So why not take the officer that's taken the report, that's his assignment, his area, his district, and say this is your responsibility. You're taking all of these reports. You figure out how we're gonna solve this problem. And that officer called these meetings with all these builders. I put this out for them and I want you to look at this. I was criticized quite heavily when I first did this in my last organization. We put this team of officers together to address problems, to uh, whatever the problem was. This was their job. Figure out what the problem is. And I said, as a team, when considering, because they wanted to know what their direction was, what were their parameters. I'm a pretty good bureaucrat. I can write a two-page memo like nobody's business, but who reads a two-page memo, right? Nobody reads it. If it's more than two sentences, or think about your emails that you get, you're not going to pay any attention to them if they're long. So six simple questions. And I said, when you're considering any plan, any alternative, any way, anything that you're considering to address solutions to a problem, look at these three, six questions. And the team has to say yes to each one of these questions. Is it ethical? Quite simple. We know what ethics means. Is it legal? So if we're having a problem in an apartment complex with a lot of bad people and somebody says, you know what I think we need to do is burn down the apartment complex. Well, that might say, you know, I might solve the problem, but it's not ethical and certainly not legal. Is it the right thing for the community? Is it the right thing for the police department? Is it within our policy, policies and values? And is it something that you can take responsibility for and be proud of it? If the team answers yes to all of those questions, then you don't have to ask for permission. You just go and do it. Plan it and get it done. Now, initially there was a lot of fear by supervisors saying it'll never work. But guess what? It worked. Because people didn't trust each other. You can't trust them to make decisions like that. They're line officers. Well, the problem is that we hire the best and the brightest. We recruit and we, we put our officers through all of these steps and, 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 and um, uh, just this process to become police officers. And we want to hire the best. And then we put them in this little bitty box and say, just do this and nothing else. If you're hiring the best and the brightest, why not use everything they have to address problems in the organization? So this has actually worked quite well. The results uh, have been incredible. Officers are more engaged today than they ever have been in my department. In three and a half years, we have totally changed the culture of our department. Supervisors are taking more responsibility. Supervisors are more open in, to discuss the undiscussable. They're willing to say, this doesn't work and this is why. And maybe I hadn't thought of that. Maybe other supervisors hadn't thought of the un unintended consequences when you make decisions and things that impact the organization. Supervisors are now becoming leaders. It's cut off. But here's something that's pretty cool too. Crime has gone down significantly. When I started in January 2011, we do an annual crime report. We have part one crimes that we report in, in the United States. Part one crimes are things like murder, um, rape, sexual, uh, se well that's, that's rape, uh, 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 aggravated assault, theft, burglary, stolen cars, and arson. Every city in America is measured by those that you report to the FBI. Our crime rate has gone down 32 percent since January 2011 in the last three years. 32 percent. 
That is amazing. But guess what? We were focused on the culture. I knew the crime rate would follow, but I was focused on the basic principles on how we lead and how we treat one another so that everyone is engaged to address these problems. So where do you start? How do you make a difference? What's your legacy? We talk about this all the time. Uh, you have to have a vision. If you don't have a vision, if you can't point the picture of success, paint that picture of success to others, then how do you know when you've arrived there? Uh, and ultimately, uh, leadership equals results. Command and control is not sustainable. So directly, I have not had a lot of, I didn't come up with these uh, resolution for these crime problems or these issues, but I allowed them to do it. 